gather by the river where bright angels' feet have trod with its crystal tide forever flowing by the Welcome to Summer Worship at Lake Junaluska. I'm Ken Howell, and I have the privilege of serving as the Executive Director of Lake Junaluska. Our mission is to be a place of Christian hospitality where lives are transformed through renewal of soul, mind, and body. Our speaker today is the Reverend Dr. Tom Long. Please join me in welcoming him, and thank you for joining us for worship today here at Lake Junaluska. We give you thanks, O Lord, with our whole heart. We sing your praises and give thanks for your steadfast love and faithfulness. You have exalted your name and word above everything. On the day we called, you answered us. Though we walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve us. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers us. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Jesus calls us for the tumult of our lives. The sea. Day by day, his sweet voice sounded, saying, Christian, follow me.
Let us pray. Faithful God, we come into your presence with thanksgiving, deeply grateful for your unfailing love, grace, and mercy. When we call out to you, you answer. When we are exhausted, you give us the strength to go on. When we find ourselves in trouble, you are there standing beside us. And so we come before you with gratitude and praise, offering you the worship of our hearts and our lives. Open our eyes to see and know you here among us. Open our ears to recognize your voice, and then send us out from here to live and work in the world as your faithful disciples. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Worship, music, and the arts here at Lake Jinluska are made possible through offerings and charitable gifts. Your offering to Lake Jinluska ensures that worship and ministry will continue to thrive this summer, this year, and in years to come. Summer worship offerings may be given online by visiting lakejunaluska.com slash support and then choosing ministry and worship in the menu. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Upon the mountain my Lord spoke, out of his mouth came fire and smoke. Looked all around me, it looked so fine, till I asked my Lord if all was mine. 
Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Jordan River, it's chilly and cold. It chills the body, but not the soul. There ain't but one train upon this track. It runs to heaven and right back. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I Our scripture reading for today is Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now, if you like fishing stories, uh, this is a good one. Listen. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, that's the Sea of Galilee, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, that's Simon Peter, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, um, Master, we've worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish, their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and they filled both boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, there is a story that the old timers around Princeton, New Jersey, absolutely love to tell. It's a story about the day in the 1940s when a fashionable New York society matron drove down to Princeton in her touring car she pulled up to the entrance of the Princeton Inn, which was in those days the most fashionable hotel in town, stepped out of her car, uh, fished around in her purse until she found a quarter. She pressed the quarter into the hand of the little man there at the door of the hotel and said to him, take my luggage in immediately. And then she breezed regally into the lobby leaving the uh, little man at the entrance to the hotel, who just happened to be Albert Einstein on his way to his office, looking quizzically at the quarter in his hand until finally, as the story goes, he shrugged his shoulders, took the woman's luggage, and carried it into the lobby. Now, that was a case of mistaken identity, misjudged appearance. It could have happened to anybody. She she took one look at this funny-looking little guy at the doorway of the hotel and assumed that he was the bellman, rather than the most distinguished scientist of our time. Now, uh, I have been teaching preaching in seminaries for over 40 years, and over that time I have gotten concerned with another case of mistaken identity and misjudged appearance. 
But this time I'm talking about the mistaken identity and misjudged appearance of the biblical text that goes on in so many of the pulpits in which we preach. You see, we preachers know what we're supposed to do. Uh, We're supposed to take passages from the Bible and then prayerfully, carefully study them and listen to them, praying like mad that God would speak to us in this scripture, that we might speak to the people. And then when God has spoken, what we are supposed to do is to get into the pulpit and tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God, about what has been said. We know what we're supposed to do. But the ministry is a difficult vocation, very demanding, very time consuming, especially in this time of a health crisis. Uh, Pastors are having to lead churches in the middle of a pandemic, uh, holding one Zoom meeting after another, patching together alternative ways to do and be church, and uh, frankly, we just run out of time, and it gets to be Saturday morning, or Saturday afternoon, or Saturday evening, or Sunday morning, and we don't have our sermon done, and there's no time to listen prayerfully and carefully, and so what we do is we take a quarter out of our purse and tip the Bible and say, take my sermon into the church immediately. Now, over the years, I've taught my students not to do that, not to treat the scripture so casually and nonchalantly, but to listen prayerfully and carefully. Imagine my embarrassment then to discover that I myself had committed mistaken identity and misjudged appearance on this story that we just read from the Gospel of Luke. I've known this story all of my life. In fact, when I was a boy, I memorized this story in vacation Bible school. I memorized Matthew's version of it in the old King James non-inclusive version, but you remember the powerful verse, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I've known this story. But I always assumed, I mean, I just assumed that this was a story about evangelism, about going out into the wide world and casting the net broadly uh, for souls for the kingdom. But if if you really look at this story, I mean, really look at it, long before this is a story about going out anywhere, it's a story about going down deep. Long before this is a story about breadth, it's a story about depth. You can tell that, by the way, in the way that the story begins. You remember how it started? Uh, It started with Luke telling us that the crowds were pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God. That sounds great, doesn't it? The crowds pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God. Oh, would that today people would press in to hear the word of God. Well, be careful. Because in the Gospel of Luke, whenever anybody says, I'd like to hear the word of God, it's a pretty good sign they haven't got the foggiest idea what they're talking about. Uh, You you may remember in the Gospel of Luke, a a rich ruler came up to Jesus and said, "Uh, you know, Jesus, I am really into the word. I'm into the word so much that I want to make sure I haven't missed one little thing. Is there anything that I've missed that would keep me from eternal life? Jesus said to him, well, you know what the commandments say. Honor your father and mother. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Oh, well, if it's that, said the man, I've got it made in the shade. I mean, I've kept all those commandments ever since I was a little boy. Is that so, said Jesus. And then moving him close to the edge of the precipice so that he could smell in his nostrils and see in his eyes the fearful depths of a God whose love and grace are so encompassing they demand 
our everything. He said to the man, I think there's one thing you still lack. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Then you will indeed have treasure in heaven. Oh, well, said the man, I, I'm, I'm not into the word that much. This is a gospel of depth. Also in Luke, you may remember the scene where a man excitedly runs up to Jesus and says, Oh my, you're a fabulous preacher. I would follow you anywhere. To which Jesus says, I don't think you know what you're talking about. You know, foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. I have nowhere to lay my head. This is a costly and demanding gospel of depth. There's also another scene in Luke where Jesus is preaching and in right in the middle of the sermon, right in the middle of the sermon, a woman stands up and interrupts Jesus saying, oh, this is wonderful. Blessed is the womb that bore you. Blessed are the breasts that nourish you. In other words, isn't this the sweetest little preacher you ever saw? I, I bet his mama is really proud of him. To which Jesus says, I don't think you know what you're talking about. I'll tell you who's blessed. Those who hear these words of mine and do them. This is a demanding gospel of depth, and you can tell it at the beginning of our story. You can also tell it at the end of our story. Did you notice how it ended? After Jesus has caught all those, helped them catch all of those fish, they're amazed, and Peter falls down at his knees in a worshipful pose. And then Jesus says, do not be afraid. From now on, you're going to be catching people. And it says, and they left everything and followed it. They left everything, the boats, the nets, everything, and followed it. Now, uh, this is not just some men having a midlife crisis and going off after Jesus on some adventure. This is a first century Galilean fishing village. Everything in the village depends on the fishermen and the boats and the nets. The old people in the village don't have social security checks. They depend on the fishermen and the boats and the nets. The, the women and the children, the children don't have daycare. The women don't have jobs outside the home. This is a first century Galilean fishing village. Everything depends on the fishermen and the boats and the nets. And they left everything and followed him. This is a crisis of decision, not simply for these new disciples, but for the whole community. The whole village is transformed by the depth and drama of this. But the main place you can tell that this is a story of depth is in the middle of the story. After Jesus has finished speaking to the crowds, uh, he turns to Peter and he says, why don't you let your net down deep for a catch of fish? To which Peter says, yeah, you know, I don't want to be rude, but I'm a professional fisherman. Uh, there are no fish out here. I have fished all night and we didn't catch a darn thing. To which Jesus said, oh yeah? Well, maybe you didn't let your nets down deep enough. And when he let the nets down deep, they caught so many fish. They swamped two boats. Long before this is a story about going out, this is a story about going down deep. Long before this is a story about breadth, this is a story about depth. And that means it's a very good story for us today because there is a tendency for North American Christianity to water down the gospel by compromising with the larger culture. We, we have our faith, but we don't let it touch our politics or our economics or our radical way of viewing ourselves and our lives. We don't let, us, let it form us at a depth. It simply touches us lightly. Our, 
our Christianity becomes a kind of sweet jam that we spread over the top of bread that we are already going to eat anyway. Now, the main heresy in North America today is not atheism. It's superficiality. You can walk across the river of American spirituality and not even get your uh, ankles wet. I love the story that they tell. It may be a legend, but it's a wonderful story they tell about old George Buttrick, a great preacher of a previous generation. Uh, he had been speaking at a conference and was flying back to New York City to his church. And on the plane, he had a pad and a pen out, and he was furiously making notes for his sermon the next Sunday. The guy in the seat next to him was eyeing him curiously, and uh, finally his curiosity got the best of him, and, he's, and he said, you know, uh, friend, I don't mean to interrupt you. You're obviously working very hard there, but I'm curious, what are you scribbling so furiously about? Buttrick said, oh, I, I'm a pastor. I'm a minister. I'm working on my Sunday sermon. The guy in the next seat recoiled. Oh, yeah, religion. Uh, I, I don't really like to get all caught up in the ins and outs and complexities of religion. Uh, I just keep it simple. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's, that's all the religion I want. I see, said Buttrick. Uh, well, what about you? What do you do? He said, I'm a university professor. I teach astronomy. Oh, yeah, astronomy, said Buttrick. You know, I don't really like to get all caught up in the ins and outs and complexities of astronomy. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. That's all the astronomy I want. <laughs> well, Jesus says, you haven't caught any fish? Why don't you let your nets down deep? Why don't you get beyond a, a twinkle, twinkle, little star kind of Christian faith? I got a telephone call one day from a rabbi friend of mine who said, Tom, can we have lunch? I've, I've got a Christian problem. I said, a Christian problem? <laughs> what is it? He said, I'll tell you at lunch. Well, I went not knowing what to expect, but at lunch what he said was, there's this really venturesome group in my synagogue who has formed a partnership with a group in the church down the street, and they're meeting regularly for interfaith dialogue. I said, wow, that's great. He said, no, it, it is not great. I said, what, what's the matter, Jeff? Don't you believe in interfaith dialogue? He said, of course I believe in interfaith dialogue. But I went to the first meeting of the group, and frankly, there's not enough faith there to enter. He said, the, the Jews don't know the Torah, and the Christians don't know their gospel. He said, in fact, uh, one of the Christians came up to me at the hors d'oeuvre table before the meeting and said, uh, Rabbi, I, I don't want you to be nervous. Uh, we're not going to talk about Jesus tonight. He said, I looked at her and I said, no, you are required to talk about Jesus tonight. And he looked at me and said, I guess somebody's got to stick up for Jesus in this town. Maybe it's going to have to be me. <laughs> and then he said, no, we're not going to have any more interfaith dialogue until the Jews know their faith and the Christians know their faith. And another rabbi said, why don't you let your net down deep? Let this gospel form you in every fiber of your being. Let it change how you view money. Let it change how you view politics. Let it change how you bear witness to Christ in every aspect of your life and seeking for justice and making peace and living for righteousness. Let this deep gospel transform you. And of course, Jesus is talking about more than just knowing the facts about the Christian faith, of knowing the data. He's talking about a gospel so deep that it goes down to the bottomless ocean of God's love on the cross, a truly profound and life-changing gospel. 
several years ago, I was on the phone with a colleague who also teaches in a seminary in another state. And he and I were working out some details for a conference that we were planning. After we got done with our business, we just kept on talking about things, about our courses and our students and our families, our, our lives, just talking about life. And in the process of that conversation, he shared with me that he and his wife had three children, the youngest of whom was a teenage boy who was still at home. And this son was struggling, had always struggled with uh, a form of mental illness, but that lately, unbeknownst to his parents, he had secretly decided to stop taking his medication. And his parents were terrified, worried that he was going to do something terrible uh, to himself, and they were simply shaken with fear. Well, I listened uh, to what he was saying to me. I tried the best I could to be a comfort to him, to be a, a friend to him, and um, we talked for a good while about this. When the time came to end the conversation, uh, I said to him, it's been, been good to talk. He said, yes, yes, it has. And then in a more lighthearted way, he said, and, and what's more, we've talked so long, you've allowed me to miss chapel today. And I said to him, jokingly, I said, hey, you're a seminary professor. You're supposed to go to chapel. He said, I know. He said, my office is right next door to the chapel. I can hear them in there now worshiping. They're clapping and singing happily. I've got joy, 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 joy down in my heart. He said, Tom, today I'm broken and I need a deeper word. I need a deeper word. Well, thanks be to God, there is a deeper word. The ocean depth of God's grace, the vastness of God's love, the God who comes to us, not simply to pat us on the head, but to take our brokenness on himself on the cross and redeem it, to redeem us uh, as well. A friend who is a hospital chaplain on Good Friday took his lunch hour and went down to a little Episcopal church down the street from the hospital where they were having a Good Friday service. He came back to the hospital with a cross in ashes and oil on his forehead. That afternoon, he made rounds in the hospital and he went into the room of a patient who had been there several days. He had gotten to know her and he described her as a kind of, well, she was sort of a smiley-faced Christian, he said. Um, she was always pleasant and chatty and was saying constantly, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Well, he went into her room to visit her, and sure enough, when she saw him come in, she said, oh, praise the Lord, the chaplain's come to see me. He walked over to her bed, and she looked at him and said, y you have some dirt on your forehead, and she reached for a tissue to wipe it off. He said, no, no. Uh, I've just been to a Good Friday service. This is a cross in ashes. She looked at him strangely and said, why would you do that? He thought for a minute and said, this cross is a sign that God's love is still with me even when life goes to hell. She thought for a minute and then reached up and took some of the ashes off of his forehead and put them on her own. I think I need some of that, she said. I think I need some of that. And don't we all? Why don't you put your nets down deep, said Jesus. Amen.
and grace will lead me The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace.